Welcome back to Martins and More. My name's Mari Rutsch. And I'm Spoon Phillips. And who are you? I'm Tippy. Tippy. Hey, well, Tippy. <laughs> jo- up, everybody, Tippy? well, everybody knows me as Tippy. I'm John Hall. John Hall, what's going on today? We are live. Well, we're always live, but we are pre-recorded from Blues Creek Guitars in beautiful Higgins, Pennsylvania. Why did you let us meet you today, and what are we going to talk about? Well, actually, I'm going to mug you on your way out to your truck and take the guitar you brought. But uh, <laughs> uh, We've been talking about doing this for a long time. Maury and I go way back. God, we go way, way back. And uh, you've been wanting me to do this for a long time. Well, buddy, you lost. I'm here. I should say you're here. <laughs> this episode brought to you by Careful What You Wish For. <laughs> Spoon, how long do you know him? Uh, too long. That's a good question. I don't really remember how far back, but it was, I guess I will ask John Hall, a.k.a. Tippy. Were you, I don't remember, were you at the first Martin Fest, or when did you start oh, hanging yeah. out with the Martin Fest people? Uh, I'm, I'm an original Martin Fester. Cause I remember thought the, so. Oh, yeah. But, okay, that's what I thought, because, because we all look a little older than we did back then, <laughs> and... Uh, and so I don't, uh, and I lost, unfortunately, in a, in a hard drive crash, and also the, one of those old internet uh, picture sites where I didn't know, pay attention to the me- email where they were going out of business. I lost all of my pictures from the first two Martin Fest, so I no uh-huh. longer remember who was at what. So. so I guess we go back as far, so you and I and Mari all met uh, at the first Martin Fest then. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, the first, at the first Martin Fest, I was there more or less trying to drum up I was starting my business back then, and uh, the second Martin Fest, then I actually came out and enjoyed the guitar playing, because I myself was uh, very self-conscious about playing. Uh, I think the first time I actually played out there anywhere was on Martin's on Main. The first Martin's on Main, me and Maury, Maury, and Maury's there, here, take a lead. (laughs) Well, that was like throwing a pile of crap in the bucket. (laughs) Take a Uh, lead where? Uh, I think to whom? Even, well, he wanted, yeah, he, he wanted me to do a lead, and I mean, I'm a, at this point, I was three chord John. I mean, that was all I could do. I had the look of a deer in the headlights when he did that to me. Well, now, hold on, remind me, you, that was your first time playing at a Martin Fest on a stage? Well, I wasn't on a stage, we were on the street there jamming. Oh, that's right. And the guy came up from the TV station, and yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah, yes, are. yes, yes. When we used yep. to play on the various areas along the street where they had little places where they wanted people to play. Yeah, yep, yep. Back yep. in the day. Wow, you are showing my age. <laughs> well, <laughs> you, you and I, it was the golf outing that you and I, uh, Maury had started, you built a guitar kit. That's you were, right. You were debating what you wanted to do business-wise because we didn't want to step on each other's toes. And he decided to go into mail order Martin dealership. That's right. And I said, go for it. And then, I mean, we've always been friends. Uh, that, I can't even remember what year the first Martins on Main was. But I remember that. The, I do remember now the, uh, the golf outing. remember seeing photos of it online. Of oh, the, yeah. If you guys yeah, lined we, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't have to talk a lot about the golf. Well, we, we had a great <laughs> golf score because we had an eraser <laughs> snuck in our pocket. <laughs> <laughs> but we, Maury and I, always going to say we respected and enjoyed each other's company. I make jokes of him on his size, but he's got a big heart. I, I can't say enough good about him. You're the man, so, John. Thank you. That, yeah. That's why we're here, to hear more more good stories about me. He, he paid me 20 <laughs> bucks to say that. <laughs> okay, hey. so, I, so I have some questions for John. Go um, ahead. So tell us about uh, Blues Creek. I'd like to know uh, how you came up with the name, and I would like to you to, to explain like when somebody would say, well, what's Blues Creek Guitars, and what would you say? Well, uh, okay, Blues Creek. I used to live in an area where we had what was called Black Creek. So I wanted to be Black Creek guitars. Well, that was taken. So I thought about it, and I thought of, well, you got the blues and bluegrass. So Blues Creek, and that's how that was born. Wow. Um, I will tell you how Blues Creek started. In 1998, I had a, a second shoulder injury. I was a big, avid woodworker. And unfortunately... My doctor told me after the second surgery, you're screwed. You can't build build big stuff anymore. So I did uh, 
a friend of mine, after I got my surgery, said, you ought to go out to Martin Guitars and take a tour. So I did. Came home and told my wife, I want to build a guitar. Well, you're on workers' comp, so money was tight. And honest to God, I went down to the local store, spent a buck, bought a scratch-off ticket, hit for 500 bucks, kissed her on the cheek, out I went, and I still have my first guitar in the room. Uh, I built 14 guitars my first year. Uh, I wanted to build guitars first, but as I made a guitar and made mistakes, I'd build a jig or a fixture. And a friend of mine said, you should sell that on eBay. What's eBay? <laughs> so January of 2000, I started my eBay account. And that kept me in golf and beer money for the first four or five years. And then it just, it just took off. I mean, between the, the jigs and fixtures and kits just absolutely took off. Then there was a point where Martin invited me to come out to Martin to be trained in repair. So I did that. And the repair business, I built, I built 290 some guitars now. So I build guitars, I love building guitars, but I really enjoy the repair work. In fact, I have a 34018 I just sent to a customer. I restored that. I have a 1926028 that I'm in the process of restoring. And I have an 1898 that I'm restoring. Not to mention, a, I think I have four retops I'm doing. I always got repair work. So I, I got all the work I can handle. My son helps me with the jigs and fixtures. And my wife is the, uh, she's called the angel in the attic. She does all of the packing, the bookwork. I have a piling system. She is a filing system. So <laughs> she's more efficient at finding stuff than I am. And I've been, uh, been doing repair work for Martin. The second Martin's on Main, because I was going to hook up as a repair. I had to work through somebody's dealership. I was going to work with Maury. And Maury kind of backed out of it. And I understand why. It wasn't a problem. I, I pulled some strings. I got in. And I've been repairing ever since, and I, you know, I will say that uh, I respect Maury. It never affected our friendship, so I never ever allowed that to come in. That never crossed our mind. We were always friends. Well, thank you. So when you're talking about the uh, repair and Martin, you're talking about you're an official uh, warranty Martin repairman. That people who have Martin warranties can bring their guitars to you. Oh, yeah, and they come from all over the country. I get them sent to me from California, Hawaii, New Jersey. Wow. I don't think there's any. Martin pulled their authorized repair centers in New Jersey. There was a weird thing that was going on there, so they pulled them out of that. But every other state has one. And I've been doing that since, what was that, probably 2000. That was a while ago. Was that 2004 when they started doing Martin's on Maine? That's about Ooh. right. Yeah, that sounds about right. So I've been I've been doing this since 2004, 2005. I have a follow up question if I could sneak in the line here. What percentage of your current work is repairs versus refinishing versus building? Oh, I, I probably do a lot more, a lot more repair. OK. I mean, I, I had 17 guitars on the floor two weeks ago. Wow. So, uh, and in terms of repair, how much, what percentage of it is actual Martin warranty work and what is it for people with vintage instruments and stuff like that that it's not under warranty? Probably about, I'm going to say 40% Martin warranty and the rest is they find me on the Martin site or uh, a lot of word of mouth. I'm very, very lucky that way. Yep. So, uh, I'm, I'm very, very happy that I have the clientele that I have. So. Well, and your clientele, like you said, word, word of mouth, uh, that certainly happened when it came to doing what we call the conversions, where people take either beat up old guitars or um, guitars that uh, they want to, uh, that are old, but they want the bracing of even older guitars from the pre-war era and that sort of thing. And you, were, you definitely mm -hmm. established a reputation for doing those kind of uh, conversions to Martin guitars. Yeah, I've done three of them this year. The most unusual one that I did was a customer had a D35 that was had some work done that was very poorly done. And 
till it was all said and done, the only thing that was original to the guitar was the neck and the tail block and the bracing. And he wanted it done as a 45 style, so he called it a D80. It's a D35 with 45 <laughs> prevents and it's a D80. So you're so. saying the back and sides were original. It had the back and sides with the three-piece back. Actually, no. The back and sides were smashed, <laughs> and they weren't repairable, so I had to replace them. And wow. the top. So basically, it was the neck block, the tail block, and the bracing. And we figured at that point, he didn't like the neck. We even replaced the neck. So... It's a wow. So in other words, you built him a guitar with a couple of pieces from an old Martin <laughs> guitar. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. That, that's absolutely true. And uh, that's was, amazing. That's kind of the opposite of the usual. Have the back <laughs> and sides and get a new top and and retop yeah. it. In fact, I just did another conversion. I did three conversions this year for him, and I did another one for him. So he's all, he's all happy. So that's that's the nice thing. So, yeah, you got to make the customer happy. Oh, oh man, I, I have to go. I have something I, I didn't finish. <laughs> well, Spoon, you, you have a conversion. When you, I should ask Spoon with, with John listening, when you look at a guitar and you know it's been a conversion, is there a giveaway or are there times where you can actually be shown an instrument and be fooled into thinking it was never converted at all? Well, that's a good question. I mean, most of the, I mean, the conversions are primarily new tops, and though people can put aging toner on them, they will usually be flawless and not have any, you know, cracked scars and, you know, finish checking and that kind of stuff. Um, I don't, um, I've never made a point of, like, looking to see where can I see that. I mean, in my case, um, in, in the case of mine, the, it, the only thing that was left were, were the back and sides. And... Um, and so it's, you know, it, it looks like a new, like a Martin Authentic would look. So, I, you know, I don't think my guitar would have really fooled anybody into thinking it was an old guitar, except for maybe you're on stage and they're out in the audience. But, yeah, I don't, uh, you know, and I'm not sure anybody, in other words, they're not relict. I've never known of any, anybody that's had a Martin conversion done by John or David Musselwhite or any of the people that, that you know, are in that same sort of network that are, close to people at Martin and have a lot of, you know, inner Martin secret stuff um, that, I mean, I mean, that's a good question for John. Has you, have, John, have you ever had requests for relicking uh, instruments? No, and I wouldn't do that. If you want it relic, go play the damn thing. Nice. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's like girls that buy jeans with holes in them. If they wear five pair of pants, you've seen them naked. You know, <laughs> just, no, I, I can't, to me, relicking is a fad. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't do it. Play your guitar, relic it on your own, but I'm going to throw one at you. I did do a conversion this year. Uh, the guitar, I actually kept the top, but I had to route out the rosette and turn it into a 45. I think I showed, in fact, the pictures of that are on my, uh, my YouTube page, nice. where I actually put a 45 rosette on an existing top and uh, we kept we basically didn't have to do anything except turn it into a 45 wow. and that was an interesting project and the reason why I took that project on is the guitar had a lot of bad work so we we fixed the bad work replaced the neck because it was somebody made a neck for it and it really was pretty sh so then we got that one done and he wanted to keep the top, so he has a Sitka top D45 conversion. Wow. So. And for, yeah, for people that are not that familiar with the, with the nomencl nomenclature, uh, anything that's a 40, a 41, 42, 45 has pearl inlay on it. And in the case of a 45 and 42, it has uh, high color abalone inlay in the rosette, like a band of pearl around the sound hole rosette where Style 28 doesn't have that. It has black and white lines. And then around the edge of the top is also high color abalone. And in the case of Style 45 and Style 42, along the edge of the fretboard, uh, the extension on the fretboard that I call the fretinsula that is uh, glued to the top, you also have to do that. So how do you go about, so in other words, you actually had to go through the finish, obviously, to inlay this stuff. So how did you go about uh, taking a Style 28 top that have or style 35 top and in, in other cases that have no pearl inlay what do you actually do 
And how does that process go about? And did you do it while the top was still on this particular oh, yeah. instrument? Yeah, what I do is, okay, I have a have machinist background and I have uh, the tools that you need. So first thing I did was glued three tabs in the sound hole. Then I made a plug to fit into the sound hole so I could establish the center. Then I routed from the outside of the first inner ring and removed wood to the outer ring. Then I took a piece of spruce that matched the top and it laid into that pocket. Then I could recut the 45 rosette into that and then put the 45 rosette on there on the original top. And then I cut in the fingerboard extension and I did refinish the top. There was no way you were gonna, you can't do all that work and not, uh, not do, uh, you know, not, wow. you just gotta refinish it to make it look pretty. Wow. And then I did all of the pearl work. And what's funny, I gotta throw one out there to my friend David LaPlante. I was showing that on Facebook. And I, I do the inlay and mitering of the heel. I can do that freehand. So I, I did that all freehand. Then he said, there's a way you can do that. Well, I've been doing it freehand for so long and I can inlay, so I just drop wow. it in. But it does take about eight hours to set all that binding up because huh. you got to start with all of those miters because there's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 10, 11, 12. I think there's 12 miter joints and you're dealing with a black, white, pearl, black, white, black binding, black, white, black, pearl, black, white, black. All of that's got to get tied in. So that's a, you know, thank God for uh, Pottsville water. That, that gets me through it. <laughs> In case you don't understand it, that we're talking code for a yingling lager. Wow. So anybody that says you're not a patient person, they're not right. Uh, you, you know, I, my wife has a lot more patience than I do. And I thought she'd like doing the inlay, but she didn't. And I found the challenge of inlay suited my character. Uh, now, I'm, I do have, I'm going through some uh, cataract surgery soon so I can see better. Oh. So I got to. I haven't been doing a lot of inlay work because of that, so I want to get my eyes fixed. Wow. Next question. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Dave Nichols, I have to give credit to Dave Nichols. He is the guy that taught me how to inlay pearl. Uh, I had a lot of people that really, really helped me along the way. Uh, nobody gets to the top of their profession alone. Nobody. So I had Martin help me out quite a bit. I've had Dave Nichols, Dave LaPlant. I've had my friend Steve Kovacic. Uh, the list goes on and on. There's a lot of people that were very, very generous in giving me techniques and advice. Well, Dave Nichols is certainly uh, one of the legendary inlay artists. And, oh, yeah. Uh, certainly knows his way around... Uh, Pearl inlay and all kinds of inlay. Uh, yep. Now, you primarily, of course, being in Pennsylvania and being connected with Martin and with Martin-centric uh, people like me, um, you work on Martins, you convert Martins, you deal with a lot of Martins that going back to the 1800s. And in fact, a mutual friend of ours that only recently started coming to Martin Fest had uh, purchased a, uh, a 1800s, one of those little 1800s Martins from you. Um, so oh, I know yeah. that you let them go once in a while, but um, before we go back, uh, on with Martins, do you get much work for non-Martins, for other vintage oh, yeah. guitars other than Martin uh, or uh, modern guitars other than Martin? What kind of percentile would you say of your work is non-Martin? Martin is definitely the, uh, the, the prime of my business. Uh, you're familiar with Roy Bookbinder, are you not? Yeah, of course, yeah. Okay. A friend of mine took lessons from him years ago, Glenn LaSalle, knows him. He moved in Florida. They both live there. And he was looking at Roy Bookbinder's guitars. He's very much into Gibson, l O and L2s. So he documented a 1927 l O, and, oh, God, four months ago, five months ago, my kid, we were building a, a, a class, and my kid was in the class, and we built one. Now we did make it a cutaway, but I liked the guitar that much. And then I got this information from Glenn 
uh, those bracings in those old L double O's were, I mean, tiny. Uh, so I just built myself one. Maury saw it over there, and he's going to play it shortly. But yeah, it's a, they're a unique, non Martin sounding guitar. Uh, so for sure, for sure. I have to have something that's different than a Martin because I got. There's a Henderson, there's a Blues Creek, there's a L double O, there's a Triple O, there's an X series, there's a Dreadnought, Henderson Quad O. That's what's just here. Yeah, this podcast is only an hour, so you can't name no, everything. I, I in can't this name a whole guitar <laughs> file. <laughs> well, it's true. The L double O's, particularly back in that, those days with the L double O's and the, uh, and the um, oh gosh, I can't think of the artist's name right now. Um, uh, Lucas. Yeah, yeah, Lucas, yeah. And, and uh, George Lucas. They went through a bunch of changes right in the late 20s. And so, you know, it really matters what year it is in terms of how deep it is and how, what the bracing's like, the Nick Lucas. Oh, yeah, yeah you have the lore. And now there's, you know, there's recent scholarship that suggests that the Nick Lucas that Dylan was playing in the 60s was actually a one-of-a-kind uh, Lu Lucas with walnut back and sides. Mm -hmm. So, but that's, that, that's, nobody knows that for certain, but yeah, very cool stuff. I think that's funny because I think a bookbinder, of course, he used to play in 1930 or 28 a long ago. And that's what I, I associate him with, of course, because being Martin centric, I've always, always liked to find out who played the old OMs and when and all that. And they were great guitars, those old OMs. They, they're absolutely, that's what started Martin into the 14 fret craze and uh, definitely one heck of a guitar. OMs rule the world, just ask me. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yep. So speaking of Wayne Henderson, the uh, fantastic uh, finger picker, uh, bluegrassy finger picker guy, Appalachian, who also makes uh, amazing guitars. Just how many Hendersons do you have now? Uh, more than one and less than four. <laughs> okay, I that's fair. Yeah. And, and how many of those did he make for you? All, of, all three of them. I have a 45. No kidding. Wow, that says an awful lot, John. You know very well that he does not have a customer's list, and he just picks and chooses who he wants to build for, and, and it's a rare thing to get more than one made by Wayne Henderson for you. Yes, it is. I have a 45. Right there, I'm pointing to the picture on the wall when I got it. Mm. I have a 41, and I have a Quad O 41 made out of Honduran rosewood. It's a quad 12 fret based off of the design from uh, Gruen's Sinker Mahogany. I just handed it to Mari. So Mari, don't drool over it too much, uh, but you can play I it. I can Is actually, today I can actually see Mari on camera, so I, gotta, I can watch him doing it. Mm -hmm. um, Is this the guitar that made an appearance at this past Martin Fest? Yeah, yeah. Ah. Yeah, the back of that, I cut that wood up 20 some years ago. Uh, show him the back. Oh, so you gave him the wood. Uh, that's yeah. very cool. Yep. Yeah, that's a hell of a guitar. It feels unfair to not share some of this. So you guys listening to the podcast, whether you're on YouTube or in your car, we're going to put these pictures up somewhere so even the non-YouTubers yeah. can get a look at this magnificent gift that was just handed. Pennsylvania <laughs> state law does state if somebody gives you something on a podcast, it's yours? Is that true? Did you hear Well, that? <laughs> my neighbor has a backhoe with the keys in it, so if I ever need it, I'll just warn you there, all right? <laughs> wow, this, jokes aside, this thing is, is magical. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I don't want to uh, derail your train of thought, but I'm going to just look at this while you guys talk a little bit yeah. longer. Yeah, so I have three of them. Wayne is a very good, such a kind-hearted man. He, he's, uh, I can't say enough good things about him. Anybody who knows him, knows he's a genuine article absolutely well, i only met him the one time and he came up for the book release party when uh alan st john had done that book about him and we we hit it off pretty well and i had asked him if he ever you know made oms he says he loves to make oms and everybody wants dreadnoughts and i asked him does he ever make mahogany oms and he says that's my favorite thing but nobody ever mm -hmm. asked for mahogany oms and he said and i asked him how much he would possibly make one for me and he told me and of course it was astronomically small amount because he's that kind yeah. of guy for what it was but i was completely broke at the time and i didn't take him serious and he said you know a friend a guy gave me a bunch of old cuban mahogany which Ooh. for people who don't know that's the real sweet yeah, yeah. mahogany species that went almost extinct in the early 1800s and some people call it floridian mahogany some people call it caribbean mahogany 
And, you know, and he thought, I wonder if he maybe, I don't know if he's going to leave the woods with me or not. And dang, if the very next guitar he didn't make was an OM, a, basically OM-18 with Cuban mahogany. And, and I, you know, I didn't know that until after he had made it and sold it. But because I didn't have any money, so I didn't follow up on it at all. So, well, well, call, so. call him and tell him you know me. See what that, <laughs> that might open the door for you. <laughs> Call him and tell him you but don't know me. He might, he might throw you out, but yeah. no, but Wayne, Wayne is really... Yeah, a, and then he came up here later on. I got him hooked up with uh, my old repair guy, Bob Jones, uh, who's one of the, you know, one of those classic flat pickers who knows, as he would say, knows the literature. And they, uh, they actually played together after Wayne did a show here at uh, Musurgia. And that was cool. They had a private uh, jam session together. Throwing, you know, Cherokee and all the old picking tunes together. But that's the last time I saw him. Yeah, he, he's good. God, he's still doing well, still going to ballparks. He's still doing well, and he has what he calls the jam program. His partner, Helen, died three or four years ago. And mm, yes. uh, the Henderson Guitar Festival is all about getting money in to support that jam festival and getting kids to music teachers and getting them instruments. Wow. Uh, Presley Barker, if you can ever look him up on YouTube, uh, I watched that kid when he was like 11 years old starting to play at the Henderson Festival, won it when he was 13, I think. Uh, the kid is just an amazing picker. Uh, he was on America Got Talent, but they, they didn't take him all the way because he wasn't drum dramatic enough. But that kid's mm. amazing. Uh, wow. Amazing. Just, and you say Presley Barker. So obviously yep. he's mm. clearly named after the famous Bob Barker, the game show Right. Host. Yeah. And, and he looks just like him, too. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, he, he's, he's a young kid. Uh, he's got a, a bright future in the music business. But if you get an opportunity to look him up or hear him. Uh, the wow. kid is just a phenomenal. Very cool. Yeah, I'll definitely check him, yeah, definitely check him out. Yeah, phenomenal yes. player. And I, I mean, he comes from a good family. He's a nice young man. Huh. You know, there's no ego in him. Well, speaking of uh, young people that are associated with Wayne, his daughter builds, too. And she, I know she builds mandolins. Does she also build guitars? I mean, what is her? She's a ukulele builder. That's her, that's her main stuff. Oh, ukulele. I'm sorry, not mandolin. Yep. Ukulele, and, of course. And she builds guitars. And, yes, she does a, uh, she's not like her father. As far as she, she knows the value of the instrument, but she is indeed an artisan. Mm. She builds a, a beautiful guitar. She has very high skills of inlay, and she's also a very, very nice person. Mm, I, I, I like Jane. Well, speaking of high skills, I want to wheel back. A few minutes ago, you mentioned about your guitar class. Uh -huh. Tell us about your guitar class, oh. how you would sign up for it, and what happens. Well, you call me up and say, I'm desperate, and I want to build a guitar. And I say, come on in. <laughs> the basic cl class is 3500 bucks, And you can figure you're going to build a, like a, an authentic. Wow. You know, so you'll have a nice guitar. And uh, we do our finishing here now. We used to farm that out, but I do my own finishing. And... Uh, yeah, you'll actually end up with a real guitar. So amazing! Uh, you, you get to design. Amazing, because some uh, there's lots of those kind of schools around schools or classes around the country, workshops. But you're often, you know, you're making a guitar, and it's definitely a musical instrument. But yeah. but you know, it's not. You know, there's a difference between the people who get to make what we would call a real guitar. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. It, it's uh, when you're learning how to build a guitar. You don't know what you don't know till you know it. And if you take a class, you will find out what you really need to know in the building process, what tools you need. Because uh, otherwise, you get into a, uh, whenever you get into a hobby, you grab a book. Well, I'm going to order page one to 48, and you find out you only needed four tools instead of 80. So, you know, we, we try to teach you different techniques because there's a lot you can do with your hands. You, you don't have to be, uh, you don't need every tool in the book. Good so advice. It's, it's lear learning, knowing what not to do sometimes is more important than knowing w what to do. That is the perfect segue for my next item. Uh, Spoon, you might remember this, but I'm sure uh, John does. Have you ever come across somebody so stupid that they would put their guitar down on a cement bench at NASFest 
and get the back of the neck all boogered up. And if so, could you tell us a little bit about that? Maybe <laughs> leaving the person's name out. I, I, I love that. That that was uh, <laughs> what six years ago. Feels like it was six days ago. But yeah, yeah, at least it, five years ago. A, and I won't mention the name, Lori. But uh, yeah, what did he do? You put it against and it just slid down or bumped on it? We were at Martin Fest and those benches that are, you sit on the wooden slat, but the actual frame of the bench is They're, cement. Yeah, sedentary rock. I guess. Yeah. So instead of getting a chance to break my strings or nick up the frets, <laughs> I thought I'm going to be a lot smarter than that. I'm going to lean my guitar. I was very careful with yeah. it too. It sounds funny, but I just leaned my guitar on the cement bench and it took just a nice fist size, maybe almost as big as a fist, divot in the back of my om28 v's neck oh yeah you put a and it was right at that fifth to seventh fret area talk about a speed bump mm -hmm. yeah I, I think if i remember right i said i was going to undumbify it exactly that was the, yep. the phrase i was going to reach <laughs> uh, for. Uh, i undumbified it for you and it took me what all but five minutes and you did it in front of a crowd it, you got to find this video on youtube somewhere there's actual footage of John taking my guitar, can I say under the knife? Was there a knife involved? Oh yeah, well I, I used that to cut out that there was a, a stone chip in there. <laughs> there was some junk in there, so I got that out. I think I used a brown magic marker, super glue, sandpaper, and four-aught steel wool. I think you had to send Mike Dickinson for something too, wasn't there? Like yeah, one uh, well, he, he, I was out of super glue. Yeah, I have Newt. Yep. No, no, we didn't use Ionute, but we used, uh, I think it was Tur to Toad. Uh, that was what we used for color. But yeah, we had that fixed in no time. And I, you showed it to me. I don't even think you can see where it was fixed. It's yet. visible now. It's, it's, it doesn't help me play, but it looks a lot yeah. better. Yeah, that was, that was fun. Because, I mean, he, you had the look in your face like, yeah, I. <laughs> yeah, I still. I it. did it. Yeah. Yep. That, that won't leave me for a long time, but thank you for the, the great repair. And yep. I don't want to put you on the spot, but that's, that should be a message to all of our listeners. If you're ever at Martin Fest and you do something like that, I'll introduce you to John as oh. long as he has a couple minutes and, and super glue. I remember one night John Garen came up to me and he said, if anybody would have it, you'd be the only one. I can't remember what artist he brought up, but he needed a set of Waverly tuners. And I was under the light and, and at the comfy inn, putting a set of Waverly tuners on the guy's guitar so he could play the next day. You travel with Waverly's to, to Martin Fest. I happened to have <laughs> Waverly's that day, yeah. Wow. Yep. You cannot be stumped. Well, I also remember you uh, working out of the back of your pickup <laughs> in the lo hotel lobby installing uh, pickups for people. Oh, yeah, I've done that. Um, <laughs> oh, man. I, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, C can you fix this? Oh, let's see. Yep, all right, let's go. I think I fixed a, a split bridge one time. Wow. I know I've done pickups galore. Like ballpark, how much of your work is done in the shop and how much is done in a truck, on the highway, <laughs> in a park? <laughs> do you do most of your work here? I try to do most of the work in the shop, yeah, but I've, I've been known to do some work on the back of the, uh, what's his name? Uh, oh, darn. Bob Barker. He's missing part of his thumb. <laughs> uh, we're friends on Facebook. He had bought a, he bought a guitar, and it was buzzing like heck out at Nazfest. Yeah. I can't remember, and he wanted to play it, and he couldn't, and we had the wrong uh, truss rod wrench, but I finagled something, and I got him some neck relief. I leveled his frets, set it up for him, I had to make him a saddle. Somebody ground his saddle down to nothing. Oh, I remember that happening. Steve. I, yeah, I didn't know anything about his thumb. Yeah. Yeah, when, he was at work one time and he got caught in the machine. He pulled the thumb off. He's missing the tip of his thumb. Oh, my um, God. Oh, yes. I, yeah, I, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Well, I don't think after all that, we're not, I'm not going to mention his name. <laughs> but, yes, yeah. I know who he is. Yep. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I had forgotten all about that as well. So yep. it takes a village and a tippy. To keep Martin Fest going. <laughs> uh, well, you used to travel with Tony Phillips quite a bit. And 2005, we had the guitars on display out at Martin upstairs in the yes. conference room. Oh, yeah. And I had done, at that time, I called it, I didn't call it Pearlzilla. I called it the monster, <laughs> the beast. Pearlzilla. And uh, Tom Buck called it Pearlzilla. You know, uh, Pearlzilla, 
is a guitar that I built at my friend Dave Nichols. And anybody who's seen it, it's got more pearl on it. Even the inside of the guitar is inlaid. Even the pearl has pearl. And the, the tail block is inlaid. <laughs> and the side supports are also inlaid. Wow. And I did the... Maury's looking at it now. If you take a look at the neck, I put uh, deluxe pearl underneath the binding up there. I did that when I got my milling machine. <laughs> and I, I, I did that all by... On the milling machine, the heel, I had to do that with an X-Acto knife. Oh my God. And I, I did all of that pearl work. So that's kind of like a D100 custom. Well, some people like puzzles, but we have this guy likes to put pearl everywhere on every yeah. piece of a guitar. Yeah, you, I think you played Pearlzilla. I sure have. Tony. Tony played yeah. it. You played it. Everybody played it. So yeah. don't call me Tony. <laughs> don't get started. No. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. I, you know, Tony Phillips uh, is a guy I met because of the UMGF, even before the first Martin Fest, and I went with him to the first Martin Fest, and I helped get it. I got him a job at the uh, law firm I was working at at the time in the IT department, and we were there for, I don't know, together probably six years, and on the very last day when they, they laid us all off because they outsourced the whole department, I get a call at the very end by a senior partner saying, now, what's this about the IT department going away? Does that mean you? And I said, yes. And said, oh, I'm really sorry to hear that. Well, I just want you to know, I thought you were an excellent worker. And as he's hanging on, he says, and make sure you tell your brother that too. <laughs> <laughs> Man. Well, I'll tell you what. We, we, as, as a long time unofficial Martin, what do you want to call us? Um, um first? Um, go um, um, yes. um first? I mean, we, Jimmy Hall said it best. It's a shared insanity. Yeah. yeah that's We're definitely, when we went out there when Greg died, I think to me that was the epitome of, although Greg passed away and that was tragic, I think the strength of that was the amount of love we have for each other just through this stupid group. In fact, oh, yeah. if you take a look, I have a memory wall. I'm pointing. Maury's looking at it. Uh, All of people passed. Uh, something special. There is a leather shoestring hanging on that frame. We were going to do a memorial, me, Leanne, and Greg, for Under the Tree. Uh, okay. I had three guitars at that time in 1857, Martin. An 1847 Martin and the 1860s Martin. No, 1887s Martin. That's the one that John Glicka got. We got yes. done practicing. This was a Thursday night before Martin. And the last thing that Greg said, and I'm going to cut the curse words, but doesn't that bleeping guitar have a strap? So I tied that leather strap on the guitar that Greg was going to use. And then on my way out, Leanne called me that Greg had, Aww. had, had, at that point yeah. he was still alive in the hospital, yeah, right. but he had that brain bleed and that's what actually killed him. So we never did the, the show Aww. and those guitars at that point lost a lot of meaning to me. Uh, the one Martin bought after they smashed that one in the movie. Oh, the Hateful Eight guitar. Yeah. Uh, they bought, Martin bought the one back from me. Uh, John Galicka bought the other one, but I still have the other, the 1857, because that was my very first Martin guitar. No well, kidding. What does that say about John Hall and Blues Creek Guitars if Martin's buying guitars from you? Mm -hmm. yeah. Man, wow. so your first Martin was in 1857. Dang, John, you look good for your age. Well, yeah, and I was a original owner. Uh, <laughs> actually, I found that at a yard sale. The... Uh, Guy had a price tag of 25 bucks. I said, I'm not, I can't pay 25. He said, I'll take 20. I says, you don't know what you have. <laughs> I said, the tuners are worth 600 bucks. So I bought it for 600 bucks. Wow. It was in pieces. I could not, I didn't trust my skills. Alex Gray restored that for me. Huh. And I traded him a 1921-021 that I had for the work. So it's, that's in, I was going to pull it out and show it to you, but there's a string broken on it. Wow. But yeah, that was my first Martin guitar. Wow. So the one you sold back to Martin after they, uh, 
after the Hateful Eight tragedy, was it the same model? No, that was uh, 217. Greg Hutton was out there before COVID, and we were talking about guitars. And I said, well, I have, I have this 1847 217. Martin didn't make one. I said, well, let me show you. And he looked at it. He actually found the work order. There was four made that year, three with mechanical tuners, one with friction pegs. And I had three of them in my shop. Oh, really? I, Amazing. Yeah, so I know that those three are still alive and well. And Greg so. Hutton is the uh, Canadian archivist, brilliant archivist, yep. who yep. who uh, did a lot of work with Dick Boak, for Dick Boak, too to take all of the correspondence uh, that Martin had in the attic of the old factory and all the orders and the ledgers and all that stuff and actually archive it and get it into order and all that, that stuff. That was out of the archive at the factory. The, the archive yeah. is a really, uh, I was in there. The archive is pretty cool. Huh. Everything, all the records are in there wow. from day one. So. Wow. Yeah, I was just talking to Dick about that on uh, Sunday, actually. Um, or Saturday, I guess, uh, you know, just reminiscing about that whole project. So very cool. Very cool indeed. How many old Martins do you have? How many, like what you would call pre, like from the thirties back do you currently have? Would you well, say? I, I still have the 1847. I had an 1846. I just sold my oldest one after that. They, they start with my birth year. I have a O1853, a D1853. 75 d18 i have uh, i have two guitars that were never finished i have an em and an eb18 for martin ah. i have them in there I, I have the decals and everything to finish them up i have uh triple o18 i bought what three or four from you at least i have uh, oh, god dick boat guitar o16 ce o28 cutaway I got too many. Wow. I have two backpackers, two <laughs> minis, are the little guitars, the, the Martin ones, because those I have uh, our friends on it that are, as they pass, they put their name on the guitar. Uh. Oh, God. Then I have a Gibson 1949, no, 1953 L49, 1953 J50. Wow. Then we get into all piles of stuff. And then the other half. Usually on this show, I'm the guy with more guitars than the other guy. I don't, I don't feel like that's the case today. And I got <laughs> and, and amps. And amps. And amps. <laughs> and I have the organ. I have an M3 with the Leslie organ that I got from my friend John Lewis. My grandmother played that organ in church. Oh, wow. And when, when the church went out of business, there was a Methodist church and he, he, no. EUB and Cyber. When they went out of business, they were absorbed by the Methodist Church. And my friend John Lewis loves organs. So he got them restored. I built him a guitar, and there's the organ. So my grandmother played that organ. That's wild. Oh, yeah. So, you know, anybody who, everybody, I've been around long enough. Everybody knows me out at Martin. And I, I, I got the Facebook page. I have the Kick Guitars Forum. Um, I'm all over the place. I'm kind of like, you know, I'm like bad money. I'm all over. <laughs> so remind everybody, John, what is the actual name of your YouTube page? Uh, I have Blues Creek Guitars and John Hall. Those are my okay. two. You, you, Blues Creek Guitars, you'll find me there. And that's usually showing my latest project as far as restoration or something like that. Okay. That's more of a commercial part of, of, of my Facebook page. John Hall just shows me acting dumb and staying and saying stupid shit. So, that's well, we all admire Mari, but we don't all act like him. I gotta say, I gotta give it to you, John. <laughs> no, well, well Mari and I have gone, we go way, way back. We can remember each other when our hair was darker and our waists were thinner. How about it? Uh, we can remember, well, I can still touch my toes and I can do it on purpose. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I, I mean, we go back a long time, and I am proud to call Maury. He's like my little brother. What we ought to do is go out to your sister's hotel. We can have, the, I was thinking about this. I was going to say hullabaloo, but that ain't good. We got to take Ha and Ma and B. So Ha Ma B for Becca. And we can have a oh, weekend yeah. out, at, out, out at the whole, or B Ha Ma or something stupid. 
but just go out there, hang out for a weekend. Maury can take his bow system and we can open mic it and just share our, just spend a night together. That really would be a lot of fun. I, I do miss the opportunities we've had in the past. And yeah. I'll say it on, on camera, on record here with Spoon Listening, Dorkfest had to take a, a real necessary pause. But the friendships we've all built, and John, I, I echo the things you're saying. Yeah. I'm really proud to have known you as long uh, as, as we have. I'd love to do that again in some kind I, of I don't know what the hell I ever did to you guys, but I was out there one time, and Mar uh, Marshall called me up to be put together a break band. And it was me, Greg, Adrian. Oh, yeah. Okay. And we started doing that. And, you know, thank you. In fact, the first time I performed in public was at Dorkfest. We did Wagon Wheel. I had my Absolutely. Rickenbacker. Ah. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure I was running the, I think I was running the soundboard for that show, actually. I, well, you might have been. I don't remember who was running sound, but I had my Rickenbacker. I played lead guitar. He sang. But that was so much fun. And then we did... Oh, no, I'm sorry. The one I'm thinking of is you sang Wagon Wheels when I was running one of the, one of the years that I ran sound, sound for. Well, they got me to sing that one year doing Wagon Wheel, and then after that, they had me do the... Was Copperhead the Road there? Copperhead Road. We all, always had to do Copperhead Road. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it, I, it turned me into a stage whore, Greg. Greg Kendig and Leanne <laughs> yeah, are the ones did. that got yep. me up there to play. It seems so. to blame. Yep. I can remember the first night... Greg said, are you nervous a little bit? He said, look around. He said, everybody else was going to get up, so don't worry about it. And that kind of, I looked around and, you know, Len Rosenberg. Rosenberg. We were sitting there one night, sitting there, and what do we owe you? It was paid. Len paid for everybody that night. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, there's so many wonderful people in this crazy group. Preaching to the choir. Yeah. You're one of them. I'm, one yeah, of we're all, yeah, just... There's too many nice, they're, they're all nice people. I, I don't have a bad, I do not have a bad memory other than maybe a hangover. I have a bad memory, <laughs> but in the sense that it's not very long. I don't have memories of bad things. Yeah, no, exactly. But, I was going to say the same thing. I, I, we've had, in fact, when we hang up, there's something I can't say, but I got to show Maury uh, that, that I think might, might impress him a little bit. But yeah, hmm. uh, if it wouldn't be for this group, uh, I, I'd be homeless in a 62 Volvo in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> well, nobody wants you to be that. No. So before we do get done, I want to speak for Spoon and say I'm so thankful that you invited us into your studio oh. today. I really do appreciate your time. Love having you on the podcast. Let's play a game of 20 questions. Okay, we call it 20 questions, and basically we're putting you on the spot that um, I think it's actually Mari, the, uh, the, the smart guy's turn to think up a model. Okay. And the wise guy, I'm just going to sit here and be in the peanut gallery. And uh, you get to ask 20 questions to try to guess the Martin guitar he's thinking of. Oh. Just your only hints are that it is a Martin guitar that's currently available for sale, like at, at dealers or on their website right now. And... Three of those questions, are, three of your questions are allowed to be uh, guessing model names. Okay. So, so I'll count the questions and we'll see how you do with Martins and Moore, 20 questions. OM28. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, so close. Okay. Right, Thread not. You got to wait for this uh, uh, oh, game to start. Right, Hold on. Yes. Okay. So, 20 questions on the clock and go. Okay. Dreadnought. No. Rosewood? Yes. That's two. OM? Yes. That's three. Okay. Red Spruce? No. That's four. Okay. Oh. OM28? <laughs> no. Oh, God. Okay. That's five so questions, including one guess. Cutaway? No. Cutaway. Six. Okay. Bearing bone? No. Seven. Pearl? No. Eight. Don't tell me it's an OM relic. No, it's it's in current production. Okay. All right, OM. Okay, ivory binding? No. Nine. Tortoise binding? Yes. OM 21. Yes! All right. 
<laughs> he doesn't care. God, I'll tell you, you know, the sad part is, <laughs> God, guitars. I mean, that's, that, that's my life. Hey, I mean, that's, you won the game in 10 questions. There have been times that some people on this podcast, huh? thumbs are going towards me, yeah. that 20 questions wasn't enough. I've failed more than twice playing this game. Yeah. And I failed once, yeah, I failed once. Because we also, we work really hard to find the obscure model that's made in Navajo or that's, you know, on this limited edition list or something like that to try to get each other. I've taken over 100 tours at Martin, okay? I was out there one time and Mike Dickinson was given a tour and he said, anybody here ever take the tour before? He said, everybody answer except that guy. He's given the tour. So I gave the tour. <laughs> oh, wow. Mike played heckler. I had to threaten to, to throw him out <laughs> twice. I can't believe it. Oh, yeah. oh, oh, man, yeah. I would have paid, paid to see that. Well, well here's, <laughs> here's a piece of Martin trivia for you. Uh, the machine is no longer in production. Martin at one time had the oldest continuous piece of industrial equipment in the state of Pennsylvania. It was mm -hmm. built, built in 1898, and it was her top and back gluing wheel. It's yeah, now been replaced. Wheel, yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. now been replaced. It's in the Pennsylvania Industrial uh, Museum. They made a later one, a modern one, but they, yeah, they kept it for. Well, they have four of them going now that are all pneumatic. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, when it comes to Martins, I've been inside, upside, downside, through the old factory. I've been through the old factory that much that I know where the old necks are, the old tuners. <gasps> I've been up in the attic in the museum, the, the Martin room when yeah. you come into the left i was in that room while it was still in the old factory so wow. yeah I, I i know i know i've been going out to martin since god 98. spoon i think you met your match so i was out there when mike dickinson <laughs> was at gmc that and became jeremy trock roy sketz then it got closed down brandon took it over wow. danny brown yeah. then the gail and liz now it's leah Wow. So, yeah, I've, I've been out there for many, many, many years. And of course, John's, uh, John's referring to the guitar maker's connection, where guitar makers can buy parts for, for making their own guitars. This was fun. I guess we're going to soon have to kill it because of the battery power. John, it's been so great talking to you. If I had more of a battery, I would talk to you five minutes longer. <laughs> From all of us at Maury's Music, thanks for listening. And let me say this, people. If you need a guitar, Maury's is where to go because... I, I bought, what, four from you so far? Thank you, John. So, yeah, he's an uh, up-and-out guy. If anybody, if he doesn't know it, nobody does. Oh, and he's close enough to Martin, he can go get a seagull, scratch the logo off, put a Martin logo <laughs> on and have it to you. But no, he, he'll, treat, <laughs> he'll treat you fair. I can remember when he first started, I came out there, I was doing setups and, and stuff for you. Oh, yeah. There was a guy there that had an 017K Koa. And then I took it home and, and re-glued his bridge for him and, and converted it from Hawaiian to a steel string. Memory is so much better than mine. I just believe you. I don't God. know. I can't remember what I had for breakfast, but I can remember that shit. Oh, so, John, but you have such a good memory. You remember that 50 bucks that I loaned Mari back then, don't you? I never got back. <laughs> he, well, he actually paid you back, don't you remember? In fact, you owe him $40 change. He paid you with a $90 bill. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Boomerang. Stay well, everybody. Hear you later. This has been a presentation of Maury's Music, your trusted source for Martin and Blue Ridge guitars. Find us online at maurysmusic.com.